And we'll share the screen. Down, don't click on those two. Donnie, click on those two. I think you only have to do it when you do it showing at YouTube, but I'll do it anyway. And there you go. And we're sharing. And we're going to go to play from current slide. And then we, no, no, it's, and then we'll, we'll what we'll it's do, getting better. yeah, it's getting better. So we're going to use slideshow. So you've got the, the big screen or do you, uh, you it doesn't want, matter. It doesn't matter. Okay. Whatever, whatever. I, I, I think it's better for the audience. Okay. We're ready. All right. Uh, you all know Ramsey. Off we go. Um, and so I think what, what we'll do is we'll keep the, the picture of uh I'll get rid of that be patient john's john's deciding what to do here um why is this not going away there you go and we'll just keep that up so in well, case people want to he wants to read it sometimes move it over well, well you can't move it over there's no more doesn't move yeah it yeah, yeah it moves yeah to our recording audience, oh, yeah, that's we, good. We that's can, good. So you just have, but I'll move it for you when you want to move it, and that way we can see. And if people want to ask questions now, you can use that raise hand function, and we'll be able to see <laughs> if anybody has their hand raised. Or since we're a small, manageable group, just yell out your question. So take it away, Ramsey. Oh, I'll take it away. It, everyone noticed that I didn't do anything. I'm just sitting here like a bump on the log. So I get to talk for a few minutes. The, the intention of today is to do the barest minimalist um, review of FICAPAN, all of 12 slides, just to sort of reorient people from uh, wherever you have been the last number of weeks or months or whatever. And then uh, hopefully in, it elicit some discussions or, or questions or challenges or, or, or whatever. So we'll see see what happens. Um, to re to repeat for those that have been through this over and over again, and if you haven't been over and over again, you got to fill in on your own, I suppose. Uh, this book that we read, Frankopan, he, it, it, at least in our opinion, or maybe my opinion, there was more or less three theses to the book. You remember he was disturbed as an adolescent, a pre-adolescent, that the Western, the history of the world he was getting in the in the Western world, in the British educational system, was nothing more than a repeat of Western civilization. And he knew very well there was a whole lot more to that. So, so his thesis in this book was to, one, uh, <clears throat> reveal to those that had never understood this themselves, that for at least two, the major 2,000 years of history from 500 BCE to 1,500 CE, more or less, most of the important aspects of world civilization philosophy, mathematics, trade, uh, technology, was focused on the Silk Road, that the West had actually very little to do with that during that time period, China more, India more. Um, and he then will go on to say a second thesis is, we all know the rest, the West rose to dominance for a time period. Uh, this is common sense. It's the centerpiece of a, a Western hip, uh, civilization course the rise of the West, as if that was inevitable and will last forever. And he said, well, one, it wasn't inevitable. There was a whole lot of luck involved and it's certainly not gonna last forever. In fact, we can already see starting after World War I and specifically after World War II, that the uh, center of world civilization, trade, technology and so forth is not leaving the West altogether, but certainly shifting back toward the Silk Roads. And John, help me out here again. I, we, I'm trying to advance. Um, be patient while John takes care of me. Uh, I need lots of people taking care of me these days. <laughs> Our one-year-old um, grandson's not quite year up to it yet, but uh, sooner or later he will be. There we go. There we go. So a few slides just to repeat that first thesis. Uh, over in the West, one ought to always give the Achaemenid Empire, we would call it <clears throat> ancient Persia, I suppose, uh, full credit for to a large degree inventing what's going to be the Western version of how you run a civilization uh, with centralized bureaucracy, uh, the, ge the geopolitics divided into 
what we would call states or maybe counties or provinces or whatever, uh, control of trade, this and that and so forth. Um, and so that, that happens early and it's not Greece and Rome that ought to get credit for that. It ought to be the Achaemenid Empire. And, and sure enough, when, uh, when, when Alexander the Great has uh, conquered the rather easily conquered Greece, where does he march? Because that's the center of, center of civilization. He marches east, not west, into, uh, into bureaucrat, into uh, uh, backward France and so forth. Um, over on the eastern side of the Silk Trade Route, the Han Dynasty surely ought to be given prime credit for really establishing the Silk Road as a, uh, as a trade, uh, a dominant trade uh, transport back and forth. But also it's going to lead to the movement of religions that we invented along the Silk Road and this and that and so forth. You can, if you look at that diet, that, that map, uh, there are several Chinese Han bureaucrats that get as far as the, they don't, they don't get as far as Rome, but they get as far as the Persian Gulf and are in contact with Rome. The Rome was never close to in contact with, uh, with, with, a, with uh, China. Um, so there's a period of time, make it more or less these dates up on the screen, the uh, 900 to 1500, these are very vague, where you've got a, a center of the world, the Muslim world in, encased in that uh, orange line, which really is the center of trade, the center of intellect, the center of technology, the center of, uh, of, uh, of, of people, people moving and ideas moving and goods moving. Um, this is not to say that Islam was the greatest religion ever invented by the planet. Uh, nor the Christianity or Buddhism or anything else were irrelevant, but simply that there was something about the the centrality of Islam in Central Asia that was uh, convenient for tradespersons, intellectuals, and so forth to sort of at least fake conversion to Islam because it gave you uh, entree into all sorts of goods and technology and this and that and so forth. And that lasted a long period of time back in human history. We don't pay a lot of attention to it in the West because what we want to talk about is the rise of the West. And uh, Frank Capan will say uh, pretty bluntly, there's a lot of luck involved there. Uh, this is, uh, to, to apologize for those of you that have heard this 300 times, we're going to go through this pretty quickly now. And he's, he loves this quote from, uh, fr from, from Adam Smith, who will say rather uh, overblown that the greatest discoveries, the greatest events of mankind, history of mankind, were the discovery of the Americas by Columbus and Vasco da Gama, proving that you can get to the uh, India around the Cape of Good Hope. Of course, what he's talking about is the ability to, uh, to, to get control of resources, uh, to control trade down the road. Adam Smith is writing in 1776, uh, is, is, is one Britain is well on its way to inventing the Dutch Revolution, is going to kind of repeat how this all happened, and sure enough, uh, there there is a there's, there the West is going to now be slowly and gradually, but in the last 150 years, uh, rather dramatically control much of the world trade. And just just to make a point, one we talked about the enormous amount of silver that will come out of the New World and goes into Spain, although Spain can't hold on to it because they uh, they blow the, their wealth on religious wars. Uh, they they screw up their economy with overinflation by uh, having prices too high, this and that and so forth. But just to sort of make a point regarding where the wealth that was going to fuel the Industrial Revolution, which is the key to dominating the planet, uh, where it comes from, a, the, the, there's, there's a lot of written about this, that the, a, a single Caribbean island, not all owned by Britain, some are owned by the Dutch, some are owned by the French, uh, that, that would produce more wealth from sugar. Uh, then all the 13 colonies of what will eventually become America are producing around 1700. That will change with the Industrial Revolution, of course. But wealth has got to come from somewhere if, if there's going to be wealth to invent, to invest inventing the Industrial Revolution, which for a whole series of reasons comes first in England. And most of that wealth comes from sugar. Um, then these rich, incredibly rich landowners who uh, accumulate enormous amounts of wealth. First, they'll sp spend it on, on, on palaces. Then they'll spend it on, uh, on more servants. Then they'll spend it on more paintings of the family. 
So they still got money left over and they'll spend it on inventing the Industrial Revolution. They don't know squat about the Industrial Revolution, but they know it may, may make money. If you get the Industrial Revolution first, you're going to dominate the world for a period of time, which is, of course, what the West does. Uh, tried to make this point multiple times, uh, and Frankopan is just repeating Frankopan, that e even with all the, the luck of Columbus getting to the New World, the Gama, showing the uh, Portuguese and the Spanish and the Dutch and then the British that you can indeed sail to East Asia and get spices on your own and bring it back on ships. Even so, India and China are not the backwards countries that we will tend to talk about them being when one teaches Western civilization and finally brings India and China into the picture when they're dilapidated countries. That, that, that dilapidation comes very late in the game. And more or less at the moment that the British government will take over from the British East India Company in 1857. And more or less when uh, the Opium Wars will devastate the Qing dynasty, which is in trouble anyway. Granted, it's in trouble anyway. Uh, but uh, still, it, that's quite late. Um, oh, we got a hand up. We got a hand up. Uh, so you, Bob, I'm, te Bob. I'm testing the system. I have it's, it's Bob Oxenberg. I have a question. Yeah. We, all the spice trade stuff, it's yeah. great. You can flavor your food and preserve your food. What percentage of the GDP of Britain was was spices? I mean, why is it considered so important? I don't know. Trade? I don't know that it is considered so important. Uh, except it's simply that there was um, tea was more important. And if you're gonna and if you're sitting there drinking having a cup of tea. I'm, I'm, do you have sugar in it or not? That, that's an interesting question. But never mind, you don't have to answer. I'm in the South. <laughs> yeah, I can't, I can't, uh, let, let me take a stab at this. So, Spice, I think the, 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 the most interesting, one of the interesting chapters for me was the history of the Dutch. And um, uh, uh, not, n not just in uh, trade, but uh, in politics, uh, shaking loose. Uh, from Spain in terms of representative uh, government, and obviously they they wound up with William of Orange and in, in uh, England, uh, but that's the, and that's where the Puritans went. But I, I'll just focus. They, they, they their East India Company was there. I, I don't know at least fifty, maybe a hundred years before the Brits. And they were the ones that started off with uh, the spice. I think pepper. Uh, or if I'm not mistaken, but uh, that might have been when we did a deep Pe dive. Pe pepper clothes, uh, yeah. Uh, right, yeah. When we did the, the 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 deep the deep. I'm sorry, Rudy. What did you say? Nutmeg. Nutmeg. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When we did the the deep dive, um, uh, the first couple of times around with the Dutch, I, th that was very illuminating. That's all. It's a, it, it, so it's a, it's a fair question. Spices couldn't have been that huge a, a segment of, uh, uh, of of what drove English prosperity, but it, it did get the Dutch to Indonesia. And once you got to Indonesia, I mean, that's a, as we well know, it's the fourth largest country in the world right now. There's a lot of people there, um, and it's not just that you have spices; you have uh, uh, cheap labor, slave labor, basically. Uh, uh, and and you, it's the Dutch that get to Japan first. It's the Dutch only the Dutch that are allowed to trade with Japan when Japan closes its door in the sixteen in about sixteen oh six or whatever, because the, the the other countries, British in particular, are not trusted. So that and and it, and it is we try to do a tiny little bit about this. It's a great part of Western Civ. The Dutch pretty much invent the, the modern world capitalism. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, uh, the corporations, uh, agriculture, scientific agriculture, this and that. It's not that the British are stupid, but they do to some degree copy what the Dutch have done, and then everyone else copies. All right, so that's not my. But but I still I, to re, the the tea trade is more important, and remember the Tea Party in Boston and all that nonsense. Uh, that that mattered a great deal, and with tea comes sugar. And with sugar comes um, dentists and and the, the worst teeth in the world. <laughs> but Whatever. I think I, I think it's appropriate that Bob's drinking tea right now. And for uh, Homer and Jenny, Bob is a Brit. And for uh, Bob, Homer and Jenny um, lived in, in uh, Oxford. 
uh, for uh, uh, a lot of some of Homer's uh, training. So there's a connection we can explore later. Oh, well, pleased to meet you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Pleased to meet you. I'd just like to emphasize a tiny point, and I missed the last session, maybe two. Uh, that is the West's control of trade really was a function of the technological advances in navigation. Sure. So that sure. was that's what underlay the rise of the West was a change in making the whole world, all the seas, a trade route, so to speak. Fair. Absolutely. Uh, the ability to do that. It, it's a, a lot of that was we tried to make the point that the, the fact the compass they had came from China. Many of the maps that they had, at least the accurate maps, had come from the Islamic world. Um, so they were inheritors of stuff that came across the Silk Road. But but quite uh, quite accurately, a great deal of the uh, the advances in in navigation were to give the the West credit. Uh, once you're out in the open ocean. <laughs> You, you better understand the stars. And if you're going to understand the stars, you've got to do the mathematics of calculus to understand how stars move. And, and all that sort of uh, becomes a, a virtuous cycle of, of progress. John. So if, if we get the, if we as a group decide to go through um, a Frankopan again, uh, that there is a, a wonderful chapter where he, he, uh, Frankopan, a, a Brit, dives deep on uh, the guy that, uh, really revolutionized sailing. Uh, I can't remember his name, but the, he spends quite a bit of time uh, talking about it and talking about the the early days of of sailing. And they they were the Brits got to Constantinople and found that the, as outliers in in Europe uh, that they had. Uh, a, a friendlier relationship with the Muslims, uh, which I thought was a remarkable insight. They sent uh, 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 later on, and and then earlier they sent um, uh, an organ uh, in the in the 16th century. They sent uh, an organ to Constantinople. So it, there, there's a lot of detail. I, what I'm doing is pitching. Maybe if we if we want if we like this stuff, uh, for those of you that haven't done Frankopan. Uh, going back and taking a, a, a close look at, at uh, uh, one of the chapters, that would answer your, your question, Homer. Carol I had a, a question, I think. All right, I had two questions. One, I never understand why, if the Dutch were so successful, why did they fall apart? And why, what well, happened part, there? Part, part of, well, they're, one, they're small. Um, uh, they they are they are they are also on the continent, and if you're on the continent and religious wars happen as they did over and over again, uh, you're stuck in the middle of those religious wars, uh, especially the religious wars which were um, Catholic versus Protestant because they're uh, committed uh, Calvinists. Um, so, whereas the British have the enormous luck of choosing being able to choose when to become uh -huh. involved in the right. wars, those religious wars, and when not. Um, so there's that. Uh, and secondly, Britain's just bigger. Um, it's, uh, and, and Britain has got more natural resources. The coal that, that was necessary for the Industrial Revolution, the Dutch don't have any of that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, their, their, their fields are frankly very infertile. That's why they uh, were, that's why they mostly did dairy cattle because uh, you couldn't raise much of the other stuff mm -hmm. until you started doing all the techniques that they invented that the British then copied, like uh, draining the swamps, uh, using manuring 24 uh, uh, during the winter, uh, using water meadows so that the, so that the, uh, the, the grass didn't, uh, um, uh, the, the grass kept growing during the winter so you didn't have to slaughter your cows. The, the Dutch invented all that stuff. The British just stole it. And, and at the point that John just made, neither one of us, two old men, can remember the name of the Brit who wrote the, the textbook on better, uh, making better ships. And, and he, uh -huh. he just went out and did the research and published it and said, look, you know, we're way behind. Copy, copy what I've learned. And we've learned this from a variety of sources around the planet, the Dutch included. Uh, and if we do this, we will have the best Navy in the world. And if we get the best Navy in the world, the story's over for a little while, which turned out to be true. But, yeah. And also, what I've forgotten what the name Jean. There was a um, 
there was a Chinese um, sea captain who was who oh, got re Admiral and, Hay. Sean yeah, Hay. and where where did that? How did that fit in with the Silk Road? How come not, did that? Uh, it, does, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's 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 one of the oddest stories, and it, fit, it fits in in proving that the Chinese technology was way way ahead of of West around the time of uh, of Columbus. This was he was he sailed seven seven sails seven trips from China across the Indian Ocean to Africa and various other places, more or less from fourteen twenty to fourteen forty. Um, the 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 question of why. The Ming Dynasty, when he came back the seventh time, said, "We're done, no more. Uh, burn the ships, burn the records of the ships." Uh, the it's it's an open question. Some of the possible answers were one: the Ming were much much for first. Zheng He didn't bring back much of any commercial value that the Chinese said, looked around and said, "Oh, <laughs> giraffes, that's interesting. Some of these interesting animals, that's fascinating." But other than that, this enormous expense for these huge ships we've built has not produced much. We always knew we were the center of the world anyway. This is just confirms that. Uh, and another possibility, a real possibility, is they were much more concerned about the barbarian north, which was always a problem for China, and said, we're going to spend more of our time, uh, the Ming dynasty, um, and, and, and energy and money redoing the uh, the uh, the Great Wall than spending... Uh, money on seven voyages to the Indian Ocean doesn't produce much. There's also the possibility that the, the commercial possibilities that were being opened up made the Confucian uh, bureaucrats who were interested in poetry and, and that kind of stuff jealous because uh, merchants don't do poetry. They just do, they just make profits. Uh, there's, a, there's a, whatever, uh, to, to repeat. Uh, he was told, no, that's it. Your voyages right. are over. All the ships are burned and all your records are burned too. Um, it's rather- well, they burned all the Because I would think with the Silk Road, there would be some kind of um, uh, transmission of that kind of knowledge, but they burned the records. Okay. They burned the records, yeah. They burned the records. Um, so let me, ju I, I just can't resist a, an interesting personal story. And it's one that R uh, Ramsey exposed me to when we went to Yunnan. Uh, uh, Admiral Sheng He was uh, from uh, Yunnan. He was a Muslim, um, and he was involved in, in some re re uh, Muslim uh, rebellion, and he was castrated. So he was a eunuch. And so his personal story of how a Muslim eunuch rises in the court uh, is, is, is amazing. Uh, so uh, that would be an interesting uh, uh, biography at some point. I'd like to say something. Aiko's got Aiko's coming in. We'll, <laughs> um, if you can't hear her, we'll I, repeat. I, it's that the uh, Islamic people did all of that because, after all, Muhammad was a merchant. Yeah, yeah. And and the thing is, the uh, Buddhism wanted you to give up everything. So they're not going to become, you know, hoarders of things. And then the Christians are too busy knocking you over the head to, you know, convert you. So they weren't too interested in that. So I think, you know, Muslims doing that is not a, a chance thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I, everyone here, Iko's point, um, the, the argument that the, the, it's, it's, it's not, and that's just a piece of luck that Islam came along at the very moment that the Silk Road was expanding and Islam just got lucky to be around at the time that that was all happening. But in fact, much of Islamic philosophy early on, now it's gotten just nuts, but uh, that's, a, that's a belated story, uh, was merchant friendly. Um, after all, Muhammad was a merchant, his wife was a merchant, his second wife was a merchant. You know, his, his, uh, yeah. and, 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 and we tried to make this point last time, the, the, the Quran is full of discussion of of, of behaving properly when you do commercial deals. Whereas uh, medieval Christianity was all about uh, how irrelevant life on earth was. It was a matter of getting to heaven was all that mattered, which, which doesn't do a whole lot for trade and, uh, and, 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 and interest rates and this and that so forth. So just to sharpen uh, uh, Ramsey's point, it was what kind of uh, Islam uh, uh, opened up the trade? It was Sufis. And it was Sufis that were the first ones. They got all the way to Indonesia, which we've just been uh, talking about. 
Uh, so, uh, uh, and, and, and really, if you, if you look at it, at it in terms of connecting all of the, the major civilizations, it was uh, the first globalization. You know, they didn't, they, they couldn't get uh, uh, the Mayans, but it was the first uh, uh, example of, of, of globalization. Well, of, of, a, of a kind of a philosophy point of view, a set of moral values, whatever, that, uh, that, 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 you, that to some degree united the Silk Road in a, in a convenient set of, uh, of adhered to principles. Um, uh, and, and, and the conversion of an awful lot of those people in the so-called Muslim world was, was more a matter of convenience than it was any deep religious commitment. Um, and and, it, and the, the Arabs were never in charge. I mean, they were in charge the first 30 years. It was mostly, uh, if, if there was anyone in charge, it was the, in charge, it was the Persians, but even they weren't. It was more simply a matter of, well, you're part of my, uh, my tribe or you're part of my uh, country club or whatever. We, we understand each other because we're all Muslims. Now let's make a deal. Yeah, one my, uh, one procedural point, Bob. Uh, there's uh, in addition to the raising the hand uh, icon, there's a lower your hand icon, and I'm not sure whether that's the case or you have another question. Bob coming in. He's, he's drinking tea. He, he's drinking tea. He's drinking. I lowered my hand. <laughs> <laughs> he lowered his hand. Yeah, yeah. I hope no one's way, watching. I, I did just find that at one point, I think it was the 14th century, uh, nutmeg was more valuable by yeah. weight than gold. Yeah, 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 exactly. Good, nutmeg. Exactly. So, and because the food tasted terrible. And then, <laughs> and whatever, whatever. All right. So there's this point regarding, uh, there's this point regarding the Industrial Revolution. You can't have an Industrial Revolution, no matter how clever your scientists are, if someone's not going to invest. Um, the, the, ask, ask any uh, startup company. Someone out there has got to have the capital to invest in your, your brilliant idea. Uh, an awful lot of that came from sugar. And of course, the sugar was created, uh, was, was, was planted, harvest, harvested by slaves. That's pretty cheap labor, so your profit margin is high. And then back to this slide, that it was really quite late that China and India uh, became the countries that we, that we, when I first went through Western Civ or somewhere, God knows, this is, this is when China and India come into the story. And we, we, I, we used to bitch about this in, the, in high school when we taught, uh, when we taught uh, Western Civ, so-called world history to freshmen or sophomores, whichever year they took the course. And say we don't we don't teach China and the 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 answer back from fellow teachers. Well, sure we do. We've got India in there. When the British took it over, we got China in there. The Opium Wars in the state. Yeah, no, that that's not teaching China and India. That's just a that's just repeating the the standard Western story that we were meant to be the world's leaders and blah blah blah. All right, uh, of course, all all of that wonderful. Uh, uh, progress by Western civilization, Europeans in general, uh, British sort of leading the way for quite some while, Americans join in, Germans are catching up. It, it all comes home to roost or all the, much of the motivation. What's the motivation? Well, commercial wealth. Um, so there's mercantilism. We can call it imperialism. I think that's more appropriate. Um, but imperialism is deeply tied then to the other two sins of the three sins, the three triangular sins. Mercantilism, imperialism, uh, it requires you to, or doesn't require you, but was easily promoted as a, as a part of nationalism. We are the greatest people in Europe. No, we're the greatest people in Europe. No, we're the greatest people in Europe. We've got the bigger empire. No, we got the bigger empire. Well, you've had the empire because you've got a head start, but we Germans are gonna catch up, blah, blah, blah. And along with the, uh, the nationalism and imperialism, comes militarism. And the, 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 the three triangular sins will eventually come home to roost in, in Europe. You get World War I, World War II, a, a civilization that has those two massive wars in the space of 30 years has got something deeply wrong with it. Some would argue. I think Frank Pan would argue with it. I certainly would. And, and sure enough, um, uh, after those two wars, the rest, rest of the world looks around and say, I, I'm not so sure 
that the the West is the civilization we need to be copying anymore. They certainly look rather um, absurd in, in the destruction they just created. Uh, here's a few. We're, we're now on to the theme, the third theme of uh, Frank Capan, that is that the West may be, have been in charge for a short period of time, but not that long. Here's here's Europe's share of the world population. Um, some of it estimated, some of it uh, quite well uh, um, uh, documented uh, over a period of time. I mean, it, 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 if you look at those numbers in 1900, 27% of the people in the world were, were from Europe. That's not that shocking, even though Europe was a tiny fraction because Europe had gotten the Industrial Revolution, they had better sanitation, better nutrition, yada, 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 better medicine. But it wouldn't take all that long before the rest of the world was going to catch up with some of that, if not all of it. And so you can see the shrinking share of Europe as a part of the world population. Well, that alone is enough to sort of uh, say, yeah, yeah, Frank Man kind of sort of right. Um, the center of world civilization will, 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 will shift from Europe. But what about the United States? And the argument is, well, the United States is only 4% of the world's population, too, Add those and shrinking. So add those together, and uh, uh, and, and, and and you get a tiny the, the West being a tinier and tighter part of world civilization. I should have put this slide somewhere else. But a moment comes when it's almost uh, second nature to say, "Yeah, we can see it if we're willing to accept it uh, and not be uh, Trumpian about it, MAGA about it." That the West's uh, short hegemony in the world did start to shrink somewhere around. Whenever I would argue 1954, you can surely say by 1973 in the OPEC oil embargo, um, things are getting to be a problem. Then it's Vietnam, then it's Iraq, then it's Afghanistan. Uh, the Iranian revolution is still with us. Um, what's our response to the uh, Russian invasion of Afghanistan? Well, we we fund the Mujahideen. Uh, that's really brilliant. And, and they will turn out to be the jerks of the world that are now running Afghanistan yet again. In Tiananmen Square, I mean, we can bitch and moan about China, about China, and it's a real challenge and this, that, so forth. But uh, after killing some of their citizens in Tiananmen Square, um, we sort of bitched and moaned for about three months, and we're right back in, Apple and everybody else uh, dealing with China. Um, uh, to sum it, just to make a point, so most of you are well aware of that. If you've never seen this diagram before, and never thought about it, it's always a bit shocking. But in that relatively small geographic circle, half the people of the world live. And if you were to extend that, I don't know if I can come up with a, uh, John, how do I get the, the oh, oh, sorry. Oh, which way do you I want to, I want to get the cursor. If you extend, if you, uh, darn it. Well, here, here, so, so you just slide your, uh, your uh, finger around. Like if you that. extend that circle, just, just pick up all the rest of Afghanistan. Nah, darn it. Just, just do it on your own mind. Here, tell the, me where you want the, to go. The rest of Pakistan, which is to the west, Afghanistan, which is further to uh, the west, Iran, which is further to the west, Turkey, which we know very well it is. If you extend that that line in a little sort of ear sticking out, you've got sixty percent of the world's population. Well, yeah, it, it's almost common sense that uh, if that's where most of the world's people are, and with technology becoming uh, uh, more and more uh, uh, available to at least the, the well-educated part of the population, that the, this part of the world, which has got most of the people and still somewhat cheaper uh, labor, is going to become increasingly dominant in world trade. I mean, you have a, uh, well, this is the next to last slide, and then we have, hopefully have a lot of discussion here. Here's some Singapore economist uh, argument, uh, of here's where the world's economic center of gravity has shifted. Um, in the last, well, in the last 40 years, uh, am I doing the math? Yeah, the last 40 years and the, the next 30 years to come. So eventually the world's economic gravity will be somewhere in Bhutan, uh, the greatest industrial power on the planet Earth, right there in that blue dot. I, I, I think most of us would say, yeah, we could accept that. Um, that that's not news. Uh, but tell the MAGA people that, uh, or, 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 or tell people in Britain that the, this, so it was made really good sense to break away from the EU because you'll be stronger as an independent single country. So to repeat, uh, the, the, the Franco Pan has tried to drive home three points. One, for most of the last 2000 years, 2,500 years, uh, the world, most of the world's history was played out along the Silk Road, or at least 
in areas that were connected by the Silk Road, uh, China being a big part of it. Not just trade, pro probably the least important of the three. Ideas, technology uh, moved back and forth as people could interact with one another and exchange with one another and share ideas and challenge one another. That, that's good stuff. The West rose uh, first because of weakness. It had to find a way to get to Asia uh, because it couldn't go to uh, Constantinople anymore because Constantinople wasn't Constantinople anymore. That was Istanbul after 1453. Uh, and that weakness turned into enormous luck because they just happened to bump into a new world full of silver and open and, and, and uh, land that was fertile and had slaves to uh, do agriculture and this and that and so forth. Uh, and eventually through uh, funding the Industrial Revolution, all that's to the credit of the West for sure. Uh, there's a brief moment of Western dominance, but Franklin Payne would say, it's not that the West is now gonna go backwards and become uh, as backward as say Afghanistan did after the end of the Silk Road, hardly that, but the center of the world's uh, civilization is surely gonna shift back where it sensibly belongs because that's where most of the people are uh, in Asia and that's where most of the interaction is gonna occur and so forth and so forth. That's his argument. Uh, the, the, third, the third point, of course, you can really deal with. So, so, we've, so we're, we're hoping there's plenty more questions. It would be better to have some really, uh, some, some challenges here and say, I think that's complete nonsense, but none of us sitting here are probably gonna do that. <laughs> And an argument against that would be to say, look, the West is not is hardly done yet. Uh, and it's and there's so much confusion in the world. And, 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 and Xi Jinping is behaving so poorly and Russia is so idiotic that the West has still maybe got a couple hundred years left in it. And the, and the, the dollar is still the world currency. Uh, and so if the West would just play its cards right, uh, the, the more or less the dominance of world technology and world ideas and world this and that could still reside in the West. Um, and the, that would be a challenge. And I think a legitimate one. Questions? Here's Iko. I was listening to Fareed Zakaria. Oh yeah, good. I was going to bring him up too. <laughs> and, uh, he mentioned uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, Russia, and China. Uh, and um, Fiona Hill said that, you know, seeing what's happened with these three countries, you know, we're really kind of approaching World War. III. I think she, I think she even argued we're already in World War. Yeah, yeah. yeah she did. Uh, Zakaria fought back and said, no, that, that's not true. Not yet. Yeah. Not yet. How do you what do you think? You you hear what Ch I could have said, Zakari and his uh, what's what's this show called? Doesn't matter. GPS yeah. on Sundays. He had a lot of he had a lot of good people on. Uh, he didn't have Fiona Hill on. He just referred to her argument that, that we're already in World War Three, and he said, "No, we're not. Uh, it's it's not over yet. Uh, there's still the possibility of uh, uh, of enough consensus in the world to 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 reestablish something." that looked like the, uh, the the understanding after World War II created at Bretton Woods that we need, we know we're not ready for world government yet. I mean, some people have been ready for a long time, but the, the populations of the planet aren't ready, but at least there could be agreements among the great powers to have stability. Um, um, I, I, every day that goes by, I, I, I think, Fiona Hill's closer. There was a, if any, if any, uh, there was a good, uh, I'll throw this in there too, who um, Krugman had a, a rather distressing uh, uh, editorial this morning saying, look, you can see it coming. If the, all, if the House gains control of the um, House of Representatives, which seems maybe more likely this week than it did last, the, what, I'm sorry, Republicans gain control of the House they are almost certainly going to play the same game they played with Obama, uh, that they play that they'll play with Biden to say, no, we refuse to vote to raise the debt limit, um, threatening therefore uh, uh, America to default on its uh, its uh, debt obligations, and uh, uh, and. Well, what's the game from that? 
we wouldn't get anything. Kruger, Kruger, Kruger's argument is that that's that's the most idiotic uh, proposal that any set of irresponsible politicians could ever make to try and wangle out um, some decrease yeah. of government that they want. I mean, the the you the first, you you if the American government defaults on its debt, uh, according to Krugman's vocabulary, um, you you got a you got you got World for War Three around the corner. Nobody will want to invest. Says it, where, where's, this, no, where's the safe investment anymore? Yeah. And if there's no safe investment, people just hoard money. And if people just hoard money, uh, good luck uh, solving the crises that have to be solved by government spending or, or, or in debt. And now, Krugman's argument was, knowing this is coming, the, uh, the Democrats, even if they have lost, will soon have lost control of the House, have between November and in January to do a, a, a clever thing. He said, what they should do is vote to increase the debt limit by a huge amount. So it will last, uh, it, <laughs> so it'll last the rest of, but he says, he says so, so there'll be no danger of, of defaulting on debt, which is a real possibility. And, and his, he, what he's saying is what the, the, the Republicans are not stupid enough to want to default on debt. They will simply use that as blackmail to get what they want. Because uh, they won't control the Senate, and what they will want, he says, is a decrease in uh, spending on Medicare, a decrease on spending on uh, on Social Security, a decrease on all these government programs that they've been angling for for some time, idiotically ang angling for them. Because like eighty percent of Americans approve of those programs, but they say, you know, if you if you're going to play that stupid game, so so there are these possibilities out there. Bolasero wins election in Brazil. Um, that, that, that seems so bloody fragile that even if the Ukrainians, for example, are on their way to pushing the Russians back, the Russians are still a, a rogue state. They're not defeated yet. I mean, where where is the source of stability these days? Um, any, any, anyone want to take that on? <laughs> and, and Xi Jinping is anxious um, to some degree, like Putin, it seems. To, to to do anything necessary to make the U.S. Uh, a, a a less powerful country and re and reestablish China as the center of the world, which is He's pushing more towards getting Taiwan sooner, and he probably wants all of the Taiwanese technological, you know, uh, manufacturing and knowledge. There was another Zakari. There was another piece of Zakari as a. a, a rather pregnant Sunday show, one guy saying, you know, it does seem that, Jing, that, that while Deng Xiaoping was willing to say, you know, sooner or later, if we're just patient, Taiwan's going to fall into our lap. It may take 300 years, but so what? Whereas Jing, Xi Jinping seems to say, I want it before uh, yeah. before 2049. Yeah. 2049 would be the 100th anniversary of, uh, of the Mao, of Mao winning in China. And 2049 is too close for comfort. So. And 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 I think the question was asked. Well, do you see what's what's going to stop him? And whoever was I can't remember who was even being asked the question. But the response was, well, you know, it kind of depends on the United States. Is it willing to make a commitment, a real honest commitment to to Taiwan? And I think most of us would say the answer is no, no, no. <laughs> what what would that look like for Lord's sake? We're not going to send kids from Iowa to uh, to battle the Chinese. In the Taiwanese Straits, so it's almost, but but, well, so there's a lot of stuff. There's uh, got to be questions out there or uh, comments. Uh, yeah, I uh, sort of like to hear your thoughts on. Or I'd like to challenge, I guess, or to explore your association of population density with leadership, world leadership. The the most rapidly growing part of the world, isn't it, West Africa? Yeah, uh, I know the yeah. Francophones think that French is going to be the most spoken European language in the world, <laughs> outstripping Spanish because of the huge population growth in West Africa. And the, just you're mentioning the technological, I don't know, world leadership of Taiwan ver compared to China. I mean, it's a tiny country, tiny population, and yet it's exerting a pretty big presence on the international stage. And when you look at pop your population figures, of the decline in the relative population of Europe, shouldn't you add in Australia 
South Africa, Canada, all the places that are effectively Western or European cultures now. Yeah, I don't think I think that would diminish the the shift that you've emphasized. Good point. Uh, who before before we Gabby people never shut up jump in. Who wants to who would who would like to respond to that good uh, good challenge? Well, I think I, th I think it's true. The demographics are um, that in thirty years. Um, Africa is going to have four billion. It's going to double in size. It's going to be four billion people, and the rest of the world is the European cultures, as you put it, are basically amazingly disappearing countries in terms of population. Um, so, if weight of population is uh, paramount, um, yeah, I would agree. Well, but is it is weight of population paramount in shaping world culture? Yeah, that's the question. Well, oh, well you, 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 you can't have you can't have profits unless you have co consumers and consumers right. are human beings. And uh, so, I, I mean, maybe 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 the whole challenge ought to be, is this the is this the end of capitalism then? Uh, I mean, Coca-Cola has a lot of consumers, um, <laughs> even though it's made in a non Western African country, there's a lot of consumers in Africa. Coca-Cola I mean, Coca does for sure, but uh, I'm just questioning the linkage of population to whatever it is that you think shapes world culture. I mean, having a Hollywood has done an awful lot to shape world culture. Small part of Los Angeles. Absolutely, but it also was useful to also have uh, the uh, the control of theaters and. Uh, a, a, a relatively you know, dependent population in much of the world to say this is what you're going to buy now. Um, whereas the, the most of the movies made in the world this year are made will be made in India. Not to say they're very good; they're pretty. But then so are Hollywood movies, pretty crappy too. Uh, the, uh, it, it's a it's a completely fair challenge, but the 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 world that we've lived in has for some period of time now has been a capitalist world in which you have to have consumption and consumption requires people out there to have the money to buy so that companies that want to start up and uh, and make profits can sell this whatever whatever it is it's got to be more than just coca-cola it's got to oh, be sure. but if they, sure. get your pro uh, if they get a lot of the stuff manufacturing moved into africa those people will have the money to spend, you know, because uh, as labor gets more expensive in India and China and Indonesia, you know, Africa look, will begin to look pretty cheap. Kaiko is arguing that, 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 yeah, to some degree, I think she's arguing to some degree, uh, population does is, is, a, it is important because right. Africa will be a great place to invest down the road. One, one can't imagine it now because Africa looks like such a disastrous place. Uh, but by the same token, China looked like a disastrous place in eight, in 1900. Um, well, there'd be a lot of consumers in Africa, correct. Um, but that, does that, that you have a lot of consumers, does that mean they are shaping world culture? I mean, we, we've, we learn how to shape taste, the desire to consume. We've been really good at it. Um, I'm just not sure that it's a simple equation population no, no it's not it's not it's not uh, you're, you're exactly right it's not it, it, that, that 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 one to one is idiotic uh, of course you're right uh, on the other hand it is it, it is a factor um and John? then unre oh sorry i'll stop yeah, well, well let, let, let me let me take a let me take a whack at, uh, at this i think um uh it, 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 if you look at uh, influence in the world rather than population, if you if you look at uh, economic output, um, you, you'll see that still uh, the West has uh, I don't know uh, two thirds, maybe seventy percent of the economic um, output. Um, uh, and uh, China is uh, still somewhere ar around twenty percent. India is six percent. 
Um, and and so there there and and what what is uh, GNP is no longer really a good measure. So let me go beyond that because there's there's I think Yuval Harari would make the point that intellectual capital is important. Um, and where is the intellectual capital uh, of of the world? Where are the best uh, universities? Um, where are the, the great uh, cutting edge uh, of, of advancement? And this is why uh, it's certainly not Russia. Uh, it's less uh, China. They're, they're, they will be hurt by, uh, by sanctions. Um, taking over uh, Taiwan will not, I, I, I heard a really good analysis of this, will not automatically give them the um, uh, 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 intellectual computer advancement uh, that you think. So I bought up uh, China. Um, th th they've got a whole bunch of problems. We, uh, they have a demographic problem and they are not migrant friendly. Uh, so that's, that's an Achilles heel. They've got huge debt problem. Their housing market uh, is in crisis. The, uh, I think Homer will agree the COVID, zero COVID policy is, is insane. And you can only carry that out if there's a demagogue uh, who uh, can't uh, be uh, uh, challenged by um, uh, people who, who know a little bit more science. Uh, they have decided, Xi Jinping in his uh, uh, quest uh, for... Uh, harmony in society to to cripple their entrepreneurs. So new ideas uh, coming from um, uh, uh, within uh, China. So it's complicated. But I, I'll go back to what uh, Yuval Harari said at the beginning of COVID. He said it it it, it it's our intellect against the virus, and we're going to win. And okay, there's going to be other other challenges, but look look at the huge strides that we've made. And one of China's problems is their stubbornness in refusing to use uh, mRNA uh, based uh, uh, vaccines, which are much superior to, than than what uh, they're using. So I know uh, the the West is down that uh, than over what what we have been, but in terms of looking forward, don't don't in, uh, don't forget intellectual capital. Yeah, as opposed to population capital. Just a historical point. I'd be interested in hearing more about. Uh, I hadn't realized that Ch China was extraordinarily timid about exploring the uh, implicate discovery implications of navigation the advances in navigation. And I think it was a problem of centralized government. I had not realized, and as you pointed out, that they were very concerned about the barbarians to the north and therefore didn't want to invest in big fleets exploring. But they did, as I read I, back in the library at Stanford very many years ago, they did explore around the Cape of Good Hope up the west coast of Africa for a ways, came back and reported to the court. There really wasn't much there. Nothing worth this kind of investment. Whereas the Dutch, Portuguese, Spanish um, explorers would come back and lie, you know, streets of gold because they needed to raise capital. And it was the, I would guess it was the diversification of sources of capital in the West that made funding these explorations that did transform the world possible as opposed to a centralized and therefore very conservative government in China. I, I, think look, I, I would look. argue, I, I, I think you're, I would argue that, or I would agree completely with that, that the, 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 uh, the, the nationalistic uh, uh, com competition within Europe uh, was enormously uh, effective at producing all that. On the other hand, it also produced World War I and World War II. Uh, that it was it was not uh, there there was not any sort of rules of behavior beyond which you didn't uh, go you you could do whatever you want uh, as long as you were able to to convince your your elected the people that were electing you uh, to move forward on on imperialism and it blew up in their face uh, and you know it's 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 an open question whether Europe 
is is got the intellectual the it, it's one thing to invent uh science and technology and all that kind of stuff it's another thing to have a population which is um supportive of what you're doing and is willing to be taxed for what you're doing uh, uh yada 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 it seems to me there's substantial evidence that the west is in a moment of crisis regarding all that well can i uh throw in something again so um i i know the world war one world war two uh really was bad for our reputation i grant that but i don't think it disqualifies our uh the model of uh of the enlightenment the idea of consent uh uh, of the government, um, of the governed, I'm sorry. And I, I would just uh, uh, boil my uh, final point down to look at the difference between the EU and the Shanghai Cooperative Organization. The EU is um, uh, rule of law. They're struggling. Um, the, uh, 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 Jared Diamond, I think, nominates the EU as uh, getting the Millennium Prize of, uh, for advancement. He, I think he put this forward in, in his book on uh, uh, how uh, civilizations fall. But the EU, uh, and I contrast that with the, Shang, that the, the new Shanghai group that Russia and China are, and India are trying to, to um, uh, organize. And I see uh, then the EU as a uh, model um, uh, for the development of an, uh, a basis for building an international uh, uh, consensus that we were talking about, the Bretton Woods uh, uh, idea. Sure, Bretton Woods is outmoded, but uh, uh, we need a new um, uh, Bretton Woods. And I, it seems like the EU and, and, and uh, America could organize that, not China, not Russia, which is like five uh, percent uh, of the world uh, the production. All these uh, Silk Road countries, God bless them, but it, they're all based on natural resources. And I think uh, the Middle East has has taught us that the, the, the natural resources can be a curse in in terms of intellectual progress. Uh, especially when it's one resource, one, one type. Um, and with apologies, uh, I have to withdraw. Sorry, because of the hour. But um, looking forward to future discussions. I enjoyed today very much. Thank you, Ramsey. Good, good, okay, good but, to see you. Before you go, let me just summarize. I, you know, I've, I, I've got a whole uh, page of uh, things to talk about. Next week, this conversation will uh, uh, continue. Um, there's plenty to discuss and, and be thinking about the possibilities for what future directions uh, we might take. I, I'll just end by saying this was my idea. Uh, this is with this core group. This is what I, I, I would like to have is a, is a lot more uh, give and take uh, with, with uh, some solid uh, history uh, when we're talking about contemporary problems, le le uh, uh, linking it to a solid uh, foundation of, of history that Ramsey can can provide us at the drop of a hat. So I'm I'm very delighted. Thanks for attending, Homer. We'll I hope we'll see you next week. Jenny too. Um, Jenny. Oh, I can't I can't see Jenny. Jenny too. I can't see <laughs> Jenny. I, I tried yeah, to change, change it. Get, get uh, your yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay. Out of sight, out of mind. But not out of Ico's mind. No, I always try to welcome the women as well. I can, always forget. Ico will be knocking on your door with some banana cake any minute now. Well, Jenny was such well, a good host. All. Jenny was such a good hostess when we uh, visited in Oxford uh, uh, back in 1971. Wow. We have stories about that <laughs> for another time. <laughs> Thank you all. Really appreciate it. Bye. 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 Does Carol have anything? Carol. No, this was really good, though. And, and I liked what Homer had to say. I think that was really interesting because I, I like, where's the role of technology, which doesn't seem to need to have 
it, it seems like an enormous influence and it's not necessarily uh, related to population size. And also I think education, you can have a lot of people. There's a lot of people in China and a lot of those people are not very, um, very well educated. They're, they're kept pretty isolated. Um, yeah. And that was one of my questions when you were talking about Indonesia was at the time when, you know, the I can't remember what part of early on you were talking about how populous Indonesia it is now, but was it always that? Uh, well, it was it was not not it wasn't. Yeah, historically, given, think, given yeah. you saw the numbers with Europe. I mean, Europe got the Industrial Revolution first. The West got the Industrial Revolution first. So you got sanitation, um, right? Better, better nutrition and so forth. So, so the, the 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 fraction of Indonesia as a world uh, as part of the world wouldn't have been as high as it is now. No, but it was always big. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's good Lord. You've been there. It's. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's it's not right. a small it's not a small piece of territory. No, it, there's in terms of um, well, land, and it's, and, it's and it's tropical, and it's it's volcanic. So and the, you don't, so the yeah. the uh, the agriculture is good. Blah blah blah. They get plenty of water. Uh, yeah, and they, they live on a lot of you know they they don't need to to farm the way that Europe had to. No. No, and 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 they're Muslim, and in, in the most interesting of Muslim ways, they're uh, they're certainly not uh, Arabs it's as far as <laughs> as far as that. Uh, although once again, uh, sadly, the that card is being played when elections come. The yeah, the card of Islam above every. You know, we, we we need to refocus on Islam. Well, actually, to, to the same to, 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 to just. Just like Modi is doing with Hinduism in, in India, and this, uh, this professor that I had taken many many courses with, he's a Zeri, and he said that Indonesia might eventually become the center of Islam because their mullahs are a little bit more liberal than the Arab ones, and they're pretty steeped in in intellectualism too, and. Maybe he was being more hopeful than well. There's not going to, uh, uh, you know, he's he's not Indonesian. He's a Zeri. Yeah, well, Islam is 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 as diverse as 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 yeah. Europe is as, as, as uh, Christianity is these days, and uh, it would be interesting to have that conversation too. You yeah, know, to to switch from uh, population and technology to say, hey, what about the next world philosophy that is useful? Um, the, the, are, are we overdue or not are we we are overdue for a, a new axial a new axial age well a, a new a new view of humanity and what the role of humanity on the planet is and so forth and, and how human beings should relate to one another all that stuff that we still uh, inherit was invented for gosh sakes more than two thousand years ago longer than that and it's much of it is just grossly out of date at this stage. Did you notice that uh, Zakaria said that, um, if, uh, what is that in Bra Brazil, the new religion now? Um, oh, yeah. The, that the, they the... love so much uh, that it's 25% now, which is really amazing. It's born again Christianity, sure. It's, yeah, it's, it's, Christi pro it's Protestantism. Yeah, it's Protestant. But, but it's not, but, but, but it's not. It's, no, it's, it's a Brazilian uh, mix, that's yeah, for sure. I it's probably a little bit African too. Yeah, but that that it is, you know, it's amazing that it's twenty five percent because it's Brazil was very much a Catholic country. Yeah, and all of a sudden. Well, that's 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 all over Latin America uh, because the men drink too much. Yeah, we yeah, and, and, exactly. uh, we saw that in Costa Rica. Yeah. I'm going to stop recording because we're at an an hour. So this is this has really been great. Uh, I hope I'll see you all next week.